Welcome and brr, if you're north of, say, Brazil. We've made it to February here on Not Your Mother's Goose. I'm Topher Goggin, and coming up today, we are just minutes away from meeting the number one ride in all of Walt Disney World as we announce the results of the finals from the Tournament of Disney Rides presented by World of Walt. But that's not all we've got today. We're also going toy shopping and coming home with corduroy. We'll return to the world of fairy tale typos by telling the tale of Little Miss Mullet. And Rapunzel's jukebox is back as we take a swing at Runaway by Del Shannon. You've got about 18 minutes to take your best guess as to what that one might be about. You know, I think we're getting close to having enough songs that we can bring Andrew Mitchell back for another Behind the Music style special. Might be time to think about that sometime soon. Now, before we start, I actually do have a request for you. In what can only be deemed a questionable life decision, my sister and I have agreed to be a dance team in our local United Way's Dancing with the Stars style fundraiser in March. Now, our team brings over 30 years of dance experience to the floor in the sense that she has danced for her entire life, and I bring zero years, unless you count my mom's jazzercise classes from high school. Anyway, we need votes in the form of donations, and let's be clear here, pity votes are accepted. If you're interested, there is a link pinned to the top of the Not Your Mother's Goose Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash notyourmothersgoose. We certainly appreciate your support, and do feel free to laugh at us. With that out of the way, it is time to get started. We know you want those Disney ride results if you haven't read them online already. Your number one ride is up next. Well, here we go. The time has come. Time to crown a champion in the Tournament of Disney Rides presented by World of Walt. After seven weeks and over 6,500 votes, at least one of which came from an email with Goofy in the name, so here's hoping it's the real Goofy, your favorite attraction in all of Walt Disney World is the Haunted Mansion. Getting 59% of the vote in the finals to obliterate the Star Destroyer that is Rise of the Resistance, the mansion has officially faced down all comers and emerged as the overall champ. Now, I will be the first to confess that I did not see this one coming, as evidenced by the number 8 seed that our committee handed out to Haunted Mansion. Even Herb from World of Walt missed the boat here, picking Rise to win in the finals. Only one member of our panel had any faith in the mansion, pointing out that it is the one attraction that becomes more on theme as it ages, but now we can see who got the last laugh. If you weren't with us for the last two episodes, you may be wondering how we got to this point. That was actually a fairly common comment from people who just discovered the tournament in the last round. How is Haunted Mansion in the finals? Well, let me tell you how it's in the finals. Haunted Mansion is here after running roughshod over a loaded bracket in a way that would have made even Jim Nance proud. Blowout wins over Buzz Lightyear, the Seven Dwarfs Mine Train, and Space Mountain, a comfortable victory over fellow giant killer Pirates of the Caribbean, and then a squeaker in the semis to take out Animal Kingdom's masterpiece, Flight of Passage. With that run, plus the win over the previously untouchable rise in the finals, the mansion wiped out three of the four number one seeds, so it gets a pretty strong claim to being a deserving victor. The voter comments we got along the way were entertaining again, led by the person who simply said, Heed this warning. Don't mess with a classic. Hmm. Unfortunately, no matter how much I play with the reverb, I seem to be getting quite a bit more Kylo Ren than Haunted Mansion voice guy there. A few people did lament their ability to get on Rise of the Resistance yet. Maybe the vote would be different a year or two from now, and one person did call Rise simply the best ride I've ever ridden. But the Haunted Mansion voters really knew their stuff. One commented, Always a pleasure to hitch a ride with Ezra, Gus, and Phineas. And I'm pretty sure those aren't referring to our two units. Another summed up the whole matchup saying, Haunted Mansion has 999 ghosts, and Constance is kind of hot if you don't mind her hatchet. Rise has a bunch of guys in plastic armor that couldn't hit the broadside of a Death Star. In a slightly more sincere comment, I think this person summed up the thoughts of a lot of voters by saying, I used to be terrified of the Haunted Mansion when I was younger. It has now turned into my favorite ride in all of Disney. It's a classic, it never gets old, and it will be a joyous memory for myself to share with my kids later on. Another person was slightly more concise, just saying, Boo! Ghosts win again. And of course, because there is always that one person, we got one comment that just said, Rock and roller coaster. Maybe next year. Must be a Cubs fan. So, that brings our tournament to a close and returns us to our regularly scheduled jokes about Little Boy Blue and Peter Pan, who is still waiting in his 105-minute line. 
Thanks to everybody who participated, and a special thank you to Herb from World of Walt for supporting the tournament along the way. Remember to check out worldofwalt.com and pinofthemonthclub.com to throw some love back Herb's way and have some Disney fun while you're at it. Once again, by a healthy margin, Haunted Mansion is your winner in the Tournament of Disney Rides. Corduroy. It's time to talk about corduroy. Not those weird corrugated pants that come into fashion once every 20 years and remain cool for about six weeks, just long enough for you to then buy a pair and immediately be told you have the style of someone from the 50s. We're taking a look at Corduroy the Bear. You may have thought that Toy Story had a monopoly on the world of playthings that start talking and wreaking destruction as soon as the general public is out of sight, but it turns out that our buddy Cord has been doing that since the 60s. Corduroy is a stuffed bear waiting to be bought from the department store. Unfortunately, he doesn't dress in spiffy cords, instead taking his fashion tips from Old MacDonald with a pair of overalls and John Deere green. This doesn't generate the interest of a Tickle Me Elmo, or even a Teddy Ruxpin for that matter, and Corduroy sits on the shelf in hopes that some confused grandma who misread a Christmas list will scoop him up off the Black Friday sale rack. Corduroy's hopes soar one day when an adorable girl named Lisa stops by the store, locks eyes, and decides that he is the bear for her. She politely asks her mom, but that request runs smack into a brick wall. Now, the mother claims it's because Corduroy is defective, having lost the button off the strap of his bibs. The truth, of course, is that Lisa's mother went to Target earlier that day for a couple things and came home with seven pool noodles, a beanbag chair, and a second mortgage. But one way or the other, no corduroy purchases in the cards. Corduroy is crushed to have been left behind, as this was his best chance to get off the shelves and not have to listen to Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy prattle on at each other all day. He decides that his only problem must be the missing button, which he figures is just misplaced somewhere in the store. So he hops off the shelf and heads out on an after-hours trek to track it down. The search is not fruitful, but it is quite a fun tour, including a mountain climbing expedition that closely resembles an escalator ride to the second floor. Unfortunately, since the hubcaps in the automotive department seem a little too big, the closest thing Corduroy can find to his missing button is a fastener on one of the Serta display mattresses. He goes to work yanking it off, straining with all of his fuzz muscle, but his efforts backfire when the noise attracts the attention of the nosy night watchman. Admittedly, I'm not too sure about old Security Sam's night watching skills, since he doesn't seem too alarmed to discover a walking furball using the merchandise to do a cable workout, but you've got to at least give him credit for abandoning his solitaire game in the control room to check things out. Move the red 7 onto the black 8. With Corduroy relegated to his shelf and still unbuttoned, it begins to look like our friend Don Freeman has written the most depressing ad for Bloomingdale's ever. Thankfully, though, there's a few pages left, and Lisa resurfaces the next morning. She's either emptied her piggy bank or sold off mom's pool noodles and air fryer because suddenly she's flush with cash and ready to buy a bear. She takes Corduroy home and sews on a new button, hopefully doing better work than when I literally sewed a pair of pants to the inside of my suitcase on a trip once. It's a long story. Corduroy, on the other hand, is not, as his story has come to a happy conclusion with his new and loving friend. Plus one slightly defective mattress that will now be going on clearance. It's time for our weekly, or I guess that's tri-weekly, look at the news, which of course remains inaccurate, but a lot more enjoyable than the real world. Tell those so-called real newspapers to call us. Pinocchio checks box at DMV to become lumber donor. Voldemort impressed by red-eye filter on his new phone. And this just in from Hollywood, Captain Nemo signs on for sequel. Illustrious submarine commander, Captain Nemo is heading back to the ocean, inking a contract for a new film about life aboard his vessel. Switching from the drama and tension of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea to a classic buddies comedy, the captain will join two friends in the new movie, Rub-A-Dub-Dub, Three Men in a Sub. Nemo will welcome a butcher and a baker aboard the Nautilus and set sail for hijinks on the high seas, or the low seas in this case, Look for an exciting subplot as the butcher and baker battle against a giant squid while they try to make the world's largest plate of calamari. 
Fans may be disappointed to learn that the famous candlestick maker will not be making an appearance aboard the sub. Writers had hoped to work him in, but eventually decided that maybe a dude burning candles wasn't the best fit for an enclosed metal death chamber with a finite supply of oxygen. We'll go from the sea back to the land now as we take a break for a word from our sponsor. Are you in the market for an enchanted castle or a haunted mansion that sleeps 999? Or maybe you're just looking to lease a stairless tower. Whatever your needs are in the fairy tale housing market, I'm the man for the job. Hi folks, you need them homes. Eh, Sherlock's cousin here. You might think I'm in real estate, but did you know I can also help you with unreal estate? That's right, here at Unidem Homes Agency, we're your premier representatives for buying and selling fairy tale properties. The market is red hot right now, and properties are priced to move. New this week, if you're looking for a cozy but tasty retreat, check this secluded cottage in the woods. With walls made of candy and a rock trail walkway, this estate sale property is a bargain price today at just $219.5. And don't worry, the previous owner installed a self-cleaning oven. Whether you're looking for a house of bricks or on a budget and prefer sticks, let me put you in the property of your dreams. And if you say, whatever you do, don't, don't, don't put me in the briar patch, we'll have your rabbit ears in the best briar patch in town by the end of the afternoon. Call me, the unreal estate agent, and get your 40 acres of Neverland today. Welcome back to Not Your Mother's Goose. Just for the record, I cannot accept the credit or the groans for the You Need em Holmes names pun. That was all You Need em himself. Let's get back to the news before I Sell em Cheap shows up. Alabama man travels to Louisiana to have specialists check banjo growing on knee. Little Red Hen passes on biscuit baker job at KFC. And returning to Hollywood, this time for a TV update, Flynn Rider to compete on American Gladiators. Somebody call Larry Zonka. There's a new contender coming to Gladiator Arena, and he's ready to climb straight to the top. Tell Gemini and Malibu to get ready, as Flynn Rider has joined the field and says he's ready to dominate. Listen, most of these events are made for me, the longtime scofflaw turned Rapunzel romancer said. Running away from people, running into people, dodging shots from a 100-mile-per-hour tennis ball cannon? Easy. I've been running from goons my whole life. You really think Nitro is going to beat me at Powerball? The athletic rider, who knows a thing or two about taking on a stage name gladiator style, <clears throat> Eugene, noted that his experience at Rapunzel's should make the wall climbing competition a real piece of cake. He said he was still working on convincing her to turn her hair into a rope swing so he could practice for the gladiator's famous human cannonball event. Ryder said his main goal is to fare better on the show than his friend the tortoise did last season when his episode had to be extended into a two-week miniseries in order to complete the Eliminator. Meanwhile, noted Vines expert Tarzan hopes his legendary upper body strength could provide a similar route to television, recently signing up to try out for American Ninja Warrior. Little Miss Mullet. If you were with us a couple of shows back, you know we did a segment called Cinderella's Autocorrect, a list of fairy tales and nursery rhyme names that were almost right, but not quite. Now, some of those submissions, like Puss in Boots or the Town Louse and the Country Louse, are probably best left undeveloped. And I'm also going to leave Hickory Dickory Duck alone, because I know where those rhymes are headed. Though, actually, come to think of it, the story of a country louse traveling by ski cap to check out the hustle and bustle of the life on ahead in the city, that could be an epic adventure, especially when the medicated shampoo and evil lice comb arrive. I have to think more about that one. Instead, though, today we're going to think about the tale of Little Miss Mullet, a suggestion that came to us from the one and only Dr. C from our Disney Villains panel. Now, if you're not familiar with the mullet hairstyle, it's pretty simple. It's two haircuts in one. Short and simple in the front, long hair in the back. It is Billy Ray Cyrus from the Achy Breaky Heart days. Or if you're a hockey fan, Mario Lemieux was kind of like a half-hearted mullet in his heyday. He wasn't totally committed to the concept. If you wanted the real thing, you needed Yaramir Yager. Now, there's plenty of ways to start this tale. Either Little Miss Mullet covered her skull, it was business in front all the time. 
Or perhaps Little Miss Mullet's life wasn't dull, it was partying back all the time. Now, if Little Miss Muffet is all prim and proper, which I feel like she is, then Little Miss Mullet is going to represent the everyday person like you and me. So she definitely wasn't out there delicately eating curds and whey. I'm guessing Little Miss Mullet drinks White Claw. Maybe Smirnoff Ice if she wants to throw it back old school. And she definitely wasn't sitting on any kind of tuffet. She shops at Ikea. I'm also pretty sure Little Miss Mullet drives a Pontiac Aztec, that old car that was like a half SUV, but then the rear somehow turned into a camping tent. You want to talk about a car that was business in the front, party in the back. The Aztec was the mullet of motor vehicles. Now, I'm not going to speculate about what Little Miss Mullet was doing in the back of her Aztec, but she probably wasn't looking for spiders. Now, to wrap this up, we are going to need something to scare her away, and that one's pretty easy, because Miss Mullet isn't scared of spiders. Miss Mullet is scared of scissors. So that should do it. Little Miss Mullet's life wasn't dull, it was partying back every day. Along came a barber whose clippers were sharper, and soon the long locks couldn't stay. Hickory Dickory Dock. It's time for another breakdown of one of these nursery rhymes that make perfect sense until you invest more than, say, four seconds in thinking about why someone decided this was a good subject for a tune. In this case, we start off with a nonsense phrase in Hickory Dickory Dock, which sounds like you could turn it into some sort of questionable innuendo if you're one of those immature juveniles with the sense of humor of a seventh grader, which we've previously established that's me. Stay tuned. But we meet our protagonist, a mouse who runs up a clock. You know, we sing this song for years without a second thought, but if you take a minute to try to visualize it, my immediate reaction at least is, wait, what? How? And why? The best I've been able to muster is that this is some sort of grandfather clock. That at least would be scurryable for a climbing mouse, I suppose. But I guess it's also like a cuckoo clock with a little door in it that we can turn into a mouse hole. Or maybe a piece of cheese comes flying out of that hole every hour, and that's why Speedy Gonzalez is climbing up. But it's got to be something like that, otherwise Stuart Little is doing a lot of work on the Stairmaster here just to figure out what time it is. You make fun of hamsters for running around in that wheel all day, but this really is not an improvement. Of course, things don't end well for our hero either. No sooner does Mighty Mouse get to the top of the clock when BONG! The clock strikes one, and Jerry takes off on the run like Tom Cruise in, well, any Tom Cruise movie. As a side note, there's actually a study that suggests that the farther Tom Cruise runs in a movie, the more money it makes. I'm serious about this. You can look it up. So don't be surprised to see Mission Impossible 11, The Docks of Dickory, coming out sometime soon in theaters. Getting back to our mouse, he ends up fitting nicely into the definition of what we'd call a slow learner. Because after the one o'clock bailout, he gets his gumption up to try again an hour later, but ends up running off in the same way at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and right on through until you're bored enough to move on to singing something more exciting, like, say, 99 bottles of beer on the wall. If nothing else, somebody should put a snooze button on this clock so we can get nine minutes up there before the disaster strikes. Now, as a final note, in some versions, different animals do the clock scaling in the later verses, including my personal favorite, a snake. My mom will never use a clock again if she hears that one. Also, I can envision a tickery dickery talk challenge going viral on TikTok, but I don't want to know what it would entail, but I'm thinking there would be a lot of dings and probably some dongs. There's the seventh grader. As you know, we love to wrap up shows with a song, and it's time to pay our first visit of the year to Rapunzel's Jukebox. I actually got this song back from our singer, Andrew Mitchell, right before our last show, but there just wasn't time to fit it in, so you get it now instead. We're back to the 60s again, early 60s this time, with the Del Shannon masterpiece, Runaway. This song came on one day, you've probably gathered by now that I listen to a lot of 60s gold, and I thought, well, there's definitely not your mother's goose characters that run away. It wasn't long before Little Miss Muffet and Georgie Porgy had come to the top of the list, and a song was rolling. So here's the end result. Instead of Del Shannon chasing after his girlfriend, it's Little Miss Muffet and Georgie getting the heck out of Dodge, all brought to life by Andrew Mitchell on Rapunzel's Jukebox. She was sitting there, her tough 
Is that a chair? I guess so. She didn't have a prayer. And as she took a seat, she took out some mush to eat, not knowing she jumped right on her feet. Strolling up that spider game, she was jumping and she's not to blame. When those eight legs she could see, then it was time to flee. It's no wonder, no wah 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 wonder. Why, 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 why? She ran away and she dumped out those curds and whey. Miss Muffet ran away. She ran, 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 ran away. Georgie Porgy had a day Boys are coming and they're out to play For they could go on a spree Georgie ran up a tree It's no wonder Why, 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 wonder Why, 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 why He ran away and he's under a rock today, yeah. Oh, Georgie ran away. He ran, 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 ran away. He ran, 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 ran. Ran away by Andrew Mitchell on Rapunzel's Jukebox. For those folks who have been following Andrew's work here on the show, he's now up to three vocal tracks, three trombones, two whistles, and a kazoo on that one, all mixed together with his one man band. What an awesome job! Remember to check out more about Andrew on the Rapunzel's Jukebox page at notyourmothersgoose.com. That brings today's show to a close, but we'll be back soon, and it'll be our Crime Fighters episode with both the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Inspector Gadget. Till then, one more round of congratulations to the grinning ghosts of the Haunted Mansion for their win in the Tournament of Rides presented by World of Walt. I'm Topher Goggin signing off. The goose is loose. I'll catch you next time on Not Your Mother's Goose. <laughs>